Thanks, Jenny. That's a catalog of a sad life. Um, <laughs> I appreciate you coming along. Um, I know it's the end of the conference. It's Sunday. Um, you're going to be heading home soon, so it's good to see you. Um, I want to thank um, Philip and Jenny and the organizers for arranging the conference and bringing me here. Um, and particularly to Jenny for giving me dinner the other night and for taking me out to Lady Jane Grey's estate. Um, Lady Jane Grey, you remember, um, was murdered by Mary, Queen of Scots, um, for being too short. Um, at least someone said it, she was executed for height reason. <laughs> Never tell a joke at the beginning of a plenary. Um, okay, I'm going to talk about... Um, <laughs> It's a wonderful thing, the English language. Um, I'm going to talk about um, the key idea in reforming our undergraduate EAP program at Hong Kong University, um, that of specificity. I'm going to focus mainly on the idea rather than the context, because I hope um, uh, you might be able to see some relevance for your own uh, situation. First of all, though, some background. Um, in September 2012, universities in Hong Kong launched a four-year undergraduate curriculum to replace the existing three-year system. Now, this reduced the secondary school experience by one year, adding it on to university. This was to break from the old colonial system and uh, align with the new colonial system. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Maybe they can edit that out of the video so I, <laughs> so I can go home. Um, but to, so it aligns with um, undergraduate degrees in, um, in mainland China and, and the US, and to give um, students a broader academic experience of uh, disciplines outside of their major. Now, this was a major, uh, massive change uh, and a huge leap in the dark. Very few countries, I think, have... Um, totally restructured their secondary and tertiary education systems um, at once. Around uh, 30,000 new students entered university in 2012, uh, admitted under two very different systems, following two different curricula, and um, uh, spanning two different time frames. Two American educationalists said that um, Hong Kong education is being asked to do nothing less than reinvent itself, a very tall order. Now, because English is the medium of instruction in Hong Kong universities, a major part of the new curriculum was the provision of English. Now, it gave us a, a, a chance to think about the kind of English that we should be teaching to best help our, our students. And um, our answer at the Center for Applied English Studies was that half the credits students take in English are going to be in English um, in the discipline. Now this recognizes that because the academic communication conventions differ hugely across disciplines, identifying the particular discourse practices, um, uh, communicative skills um, of target groups becomes key to teaching un um, English at university. Now, under the new curriculum, um, all 3,000 first-year students take our um, core university English course. Um, this is an EGAP course for six credits. It's a program which is really designed to bridge the gap between school-based English and the disciplinary studies that they're going to encounter after their second year. So perhaps it's something like a um, close to a UK pre-sessional. Now here, we want to see, we want to help students see that, that um, writing at university is very different to writing at school and to take responsibility for clarity in their writing, giving them the tools that they can do, that they can use to do this. And this means helping them to see that academic writing in English compared with many other contexts and many other languages uh, tends to be very explicit about its structure and its purpose, so there's a lot of previewing and reviewing that they haven't encountered before, uh, that it supports arguments with citations and providing ways of um, helping them to see how they do that, uh, that it focuses on actions rather than actors, it uses far fewer rhetorical questions than they're used to when writing at uh, school essays, 
it's intolerant of digressions, it's very cautious in making claims, it packages processes as things, and it spells out very explicitly steps in arguments and connections between ideas. Now, because of all this, we try to familiarize them with um, concepts like nominalization, impersonalization, connectives, hedging, citation, metadiscourse. So that's um, the first year uh, course. Um, bring students up to speed with uh, uh, general academic English. After the first year, they take one of our 30 new English in the discipline courses. Now, depending on the cooperation we can get with faculties, these are either parallel a subject course or they, um, they're a composite of uh, uh, courses within a particular, particular field. So the idea here then is to try and offer students a more discipline, uh, a context sensitive provision of English based on, based on a, 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 as close a partnership as we can get with faculties and with research informed course design. So we've spent the last five years trying to put these together. Okay, that's the context. Um, I want to now um, give you some evidence for the importance of specificity, um, taken from four very different um, perspectives. First of all, um, rhetorical choices are vary enormously across disciplines because they express the the different epistemological and social practices of different fields. So students learn their disciplines at the same time as they learn the discourse of their disciplines. Now I don't really have time to go into specific disciplinary differences, so I'm going to use a very blunt instrument here and look at some uh, features across um, uh, the broad, hard and soft divide. Um, but I think it, it tells us something about how writers take different positions towards their, their texts and their readers. Now this is based on um, a corpus of uh, um, uh, one and a half million words, um, 240 research articles. Now most predictably we can see that authors in the soft knowledge disciplines intrude into their texts through the use of I or we almost three times more frequently than those in the sciences. So this is, allows them to claim authority uh, through personal convictions and to emphasize their uh, contribution. So it sends a clear signal of the, the writer's perspective and it distinguishes that perspective from that of others. But while self-mention can help construct an authoritative um, writer in the soft fields, authors in the hard sciences generally downplay their personal role to em establish the objectivity of what they're talking about. So they report results uncontaminated by the human um, intervention. So they're concerned with generalizations rather than individuals and uh, um, this is done by distancing the writer from the, uh, um, from the text and from interpretations in ways that, that we all use, that we're all very familiar with, um, teaching the passive, dummy it subjects, and uh, attributing agency to inanimate things like images, results, tables, and so on, which takes the, the writer out of the picture um, and allows... Uh, the writer to subordinate their voice to the voice of nature, um, relying on the on the persuasion of the um, uh, lab procedures rather than on the, the 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 force of writing. We also find big variations in um, citation practices, reflecting the extent that writers can assume a shared context with uh, readers. So normal science, what Kuhn sees as normal science, produces public knowledge through relatively steady cumulative growth. Um, it's, it's, it's fairly linear. Problems emerge on the back of previous problems, uh, 
And this allows writers to rely on readers recognizing the significance of the research without excessive referencing. So there, writers and readers are often working on the same thing, um, on the same problems. They're familiar with the earlier work. In the humanities and social sciences, of course, um, research is less linear. The literature is more dispersed, with the readership more heterogeneous. Writers can't presuppose uh, a shared context to the same extent. They have to build this context far more through, through citation. And this also helps to explain the, um, the difference in self-citation. So we find um, about 12.5% of all citations in the sciences um, are uh, self-citations, whereas it's only 4% in the, in the humanities. So it's the linearity of research, uh, which means that scientists are, are constantly building on their own work, whereas it's much more uh, diverse in the um, soft knowledge fields. Um, hedges and boosters um, also index disciplinary practices. Uh, both occur far more frequently in the arts and humanities. Um, as you know, hedges are devices which withhold complete commitment to a proposition. They imply that the, um, a claim is based on the writer's plausible reasoning rather than certain knowledge. Boosters, on the other hand, stress certainty. They, um, they, they push the, right, the commitment of the writer to statements. Now, because these represent the writer's direct involvement in um, a text, they're getting on for twice as common in the uh, arts and humanities than in the sciences. So um, hedges indicate the degree of confidence that the writer thinks it might be wise to give a claim, um, while opening a discursive space which allows readers to dispute interpretations. So if someone says perhaps or probably, then the reader's got a, an in to, um, to say, well, my, I've got a different opinion. Um, now, one reason that they're more common in the soft fields is that there's less control of variables, more diversity of research outcomes, fewer clear basis for accepting claims than in the sciences. So writers can't report research with the same confidence of shared assumptions. Um, arguments have to be expressed more cautiously using more hedges. But because methods and results are more open to question, writers sometimes also want to um, use boosters to, um, to reinforce their view, to close down alternative um, opinions and use things like uh, definitely, um, prove, certain, and so on. In the hard sciences, of course, positivist epistemologies mean that the authority of the individual is subordinated to the authority of the text, and facts are supposed to speak for themselves. Now, this means that writers often disguise their interpretive activity behind linguistic objectivity. Um, the results, or the, 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 they want to suggest that the results would be the same whoever carried out the research. It's not supposed to be important who did it. And one way of, of disguising the um, uh, the writer is to use fewer hedges. And when they do use hedges, they tend to be modals rather than cognitive verbs. Now this is because cognitive verbs obviously more easily combine with, with animate subjects, uh, the person making the evaluation. So these are cognitive hedges. Um, uh, it seems sensible to assume they were probably not unreflective. We believe it might have been better. And there are, far, there are far fewer of these in the sciences. In the sciences, agency is far more dis disguised. It could be interpreted as it may have been caused by, um, and they, these are much more frequent in the sciences. So modals are one way of helping to reinforce a view of science as um, uh, an impersonal, inductive uh, enterprise while allowing scientists to see themselves as discovering the truth rather than as constructing it through argument, through language. 
Um, the final feature I just want to talk about here um, is the extent to which um, succinctness and precision are really uh, valued or even possible between different uh, disciplines, looking at directives. Now, directives instruct the reader to act or to see things in a certain way. So they're um, expressed through imperatives, um, like uh, consider, note, imagine, obligation modals, should, must, have to, so on. And they direct the reader to three main activities. So we've got textual directives, which uh, direct readers to another part of the text or to another text altogether. Physical directives, which instruct readers to perform an action in a certain way, usually in the methods section. And cognitive uh, directives, which instruct readers how to interpret an argument. So they explicitly position the reader um, by encouraging them to, to see things in a certain way. Now, these are not only more um, frequent in the sciences, but they also function differently. So while directives represent a writer's personal intrusion into a text, we might expect to find them more frequently in, um, in the uh, humanities and arts. Um, they carry a very high risk for the writer because they tell the reader how they should see things. In, um, so if, but if we take out philosophy, 60% of all directives in the soft knowledge text um, direct readers to a reference or a table rather than telling them how they should interpret an argument. In the soft fields, on the other hand, uh, sorry, in the sciences, on the other hand, largely guide readers explicitly through an argument. So emphasizing what readers should attend to, how they should understand uh, a, a claim. So this is because I think the, 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 the sort of linear um, problem-oriented nature of the natural sciences enables researchers to um, write within an established framework and to write using a highly standardized code. So arguments can be formulated um, more precisely and uh, uh, presupposing a lot of background. There's also the fact that um, in the sciences, succinctness is very highly valued by editors who have a bias to publish. They're trying to publish as many papers as possible. And uh, by information-saturated scientists who are reading for the bottom line. Um, so directives help writers get, get through, cut to the heart of technical matters. So I think there's a, a lot of features of writing reflect these disciplinary variations. A second way that, um, a second argument I think for uh, understanding specificity and the importance of specificity is to think about how individuals present a scholarly identity. And one way that um, we can see this most clearly is in the relatively un unsung genre of the academic bio. Now, this is a genre where in 50 to 100 words, academics create a, a, a narrative of expertise for themselves. So um, they're authentic, naturally occurring texts, which are interesting because they've been stripped, uh, they, 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 they sit next to a research article, which has been stripped of all identifying um, uh, information. So. Um, because of blind, blind review. Now my corpus here was 600 bios from leading journals in three uh, disciplines, 200 in each. I also controlled for gender um, with 100 male and female bios um, in each discipline and um, by status using four categories from senior academics through to uh, uh, technicians. And in the analysis, I looked at what people said about themselves and how they said it to, 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 to tease out something about uh, variation in, in um, self-presentation. So first of all, I looked at what people uh, said about themselves. Um, now, it turns out that writers included 
Um, um, what writers include obviously says a lot about the kind of identities that are likely to be valued in particular by particular disciplines. And it turns out that um, virtually everyone mentioned employment. And with research interests, this comprised about half of all the acts in the corpus. Now for junior academics, um, this is often all they've got to say about themselves. Uh, but for professors, um, uh, we find um, the mention of research, employment, publications, and achievements all increase as you go up the status ladder. In terms of gender, this um, seems to be relatively unimportant in academic bios. What men and what women said about themselves was relatively similar. And it seems that um, discipline is the most significant influence on what uh, people uh, in decide to include in their bios. Now, the biggest disciplinary difference was the weight that engineers give to um, education. So, uh, they, for them, this was typically linked to an area of study demonstrating a specific expertise and insider competence. So, I think this, this reflects something of the apprenticeship model of education in, in science and engineering, where, where students um, uh, publish as part of a research team, um, making education a, a key part of their, of their, of their really self-perception, the way they want to present themselves. We also find engineers giving a lot more weight to uh, personal information. Almost all engineers um, mentioned their birthplace. I don't know why. Um, some even their year of birth. Um, Check it out. I mean, it is very strange. Um, in contrast, applied linguists um, um, crafted identities around their research interests, making a claim for um, credibility through their, uh, this insider expertise. And these made up about a third of all the statements in the, um, in the uh, applied linguist bios. Philosophers, on the other hand, parade their publications. Um, I, I guess this is because in philosophy, most of their publications are monographs. They take a lot longer than the kind of um, frenetically paced, multiply authored, um, uh, rapidly published uh, research articles in, in the sciences. So they count for a lot more when you're trying to construct a, a statement about yourself. Now, identity is expressed not only through what people, uh, what we talk about, but how we talk about it. And I think one way of getting at um, identity in this way is to borrow from systemic linguistics and look at verbs, or what they call process types. Now, um, SFL recognizes a distinction between mental processes, which are verbs related to sensing, like uh, think, feel, believe, um, and material processes, which are about doing, like um, work, write, study. And a third uh, category is relational processes, which express being. Now, these choices matter, I think, um, because, for example, if you say she is interested in, this is a mental process, and it constructs the writer as um, an active, thinking, being, exercising choice. If you present yourself as her research interests are, ah, this is a relational process, and it downplays the author's role, active role, to say that uh, this is something that um, belongs to her. Now again, we can see um, uh, that acting on the world in some way, using material processes, um, is more visible and more active than um, subjectively interpreting it through mental processes. Now overall, um, relational and material processes were used in 95% of all um, uh, clauses. They stress, they stress what the writer thinks they are and what they do. So this is because um, relational and material processes have something to say about who the author is or how the author wants to be seen. 
Now, interestingly, the table shows that um, relational forms increase with rank and uh, material forms decrease with rank. Now, this is a little bit scary because what it suggests is that um, our activities um, shift through our careers from something we do to something we are. I find that a, a bit worrying. Um, but um, anyway, relational clauses represent identity claims as they construe being. Um, a, value, a writer claims to be something. Now, these claims are strengthened by uh, identifying over attributive clauses. And they're twice as common with professors. So professors say, um, is professor, or is the author. And these give a definiteness and uniqueness to an identity. Whereas attributive uh, uh, um, relational um, clauses uh, merely stress membership, is a member of, or is a PhD student, rather than a uniquely identifying um, statement. So, um, status then has some impact on identity representation. But once again, it isn't status or gender, um, but <coughs> discipline, which is um, the major influence on choice. So applied linguists mainly use mental processes. So they construct themselves as uh, um, intellectuals. So they're a thinking, active, academic rather than a, 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 a worker grinding out a quota of, of papers and, and um, conference presentations. Um, the engineers emphasize verbal processes. So they uh, use a lot of uh, um, verbs which can highlight agency, saying that they're active scholars. Um, the philosophers on the other hand, with the biggest variation, um, with a lot of relational clauses, twice as many as linguists and four times more than engineers. And I think this is something to do with the fact that um, reflect the more individualistic ethos in philosophy. Um, here, research represents the creative uh, insights of the author rather than the um, humble uh, uh, ideology of the sciences, which sees the scientists as a member of a team. So it seems to be that, that the way that people present themselves, the language that they use, differs by discipline. A third uh, argument for disciplinary difference is um, the, the, the different views that writers, that teachers have in the faculties about the importance of writing and feedback. Now. Um, here, this is a, a study I did at Hong Kong U uh, very recently. Um, I interviewed academics from uh, four faculties um, representing eight disciplines. And it, it, um, it seems that all teachers set writing assignments. So often, for, or always for assessment, often as the only form of assessment. But the soft knowledge tutors saw this as a measure, more than a measure of quality control but of developing skills of disciplinary argument. So a history professor told me, writing is absolutely key. It embodies the discipline, the main disciplinary product. Teaching history is about teaching students to write, what I expect them to gain, as well as the ability to express themselves. The ability to engage more effectively with discourses in the past. And you can't do that unless you can articulate precisely what the discourse means. So very uh, clear view of what the importance of writing. Similarly, a business professor, I think writing is very important. It reflects the way students structure and express their thoughts. So I'm less concerned about correct spelling and grammar. What I'm very concerned about is teaching them to write logical essays, which take a research question and address it in a structured and thoughtful way with evidence and logical conclusions. Now for researchers in the sciences, on the other hand, writing was less important. And the fact that students were writing in a second language was often treated as, as something very minor. If they have problems with language errors, that means they're not working hard enough. Um, this is one point of view, isn't it? Uh, they're 21 years old. I mean, they should have a high level of ability already, not just what they have learned since coming here. 
When I assess their writing, I have to treat everybody equally, so I grade grammar less, maybe a small percentage, 5%. So um, when I looked at the texts themselves, the kinds of feedback that people were giving, um, it was uh, um, typically less frequent and more cursory in the science papers. So generally just, just hurriedly ticked or, or grayed rather than carefully read. This is um, uh, the, the soft knowledge uh, teachers often gave uh, responses to, um, uh, to the grammar, though, and to the writing. Um, this is an example of something given by a history teacher. And um, similarly, some from business. Avoid long sentences. Before you have control over sentence structure, use a single sentence for each point. This will allow readers to see your argument better. Good advice, probably. Um, but on the, uh, the, in contrast to this explicit uh, sort of um, uh, response, uh, these comments actually were largely seen as aspects of disciplinary writing rather than just getting students' language right. So an English teacher said, I suppose my feedback is trying to help them clearly state a claim or idea and then how they can develop it in an appropriate style. So it's about encouraging clarity of thought and defining a question to discuss. So what they want in the faculty is, um, is, is, is disciplinary specific ways of constructing argument. Um, in contrast to these, these, these paragons of virtue, the, Tutors in the hard sciences rarely required drafts and gave no feedback. So an engineer said, I don't ask for a draft. Their report is an assignment. They're graded on this. If we give them a chance to write a draft, uh, we are just giving a grade to our own work. We don't write their exams, so why write their reports? I'm sure you've come across that kind of view before. Um, in, for some, especially in the sciences, um, Setting assignments was a way of seeing if students had understood the course. Um, feedback had very doubtful significance. So I don't think it makes a lot of difference, to be honest. It depends on the students. Some will come and talk about it and go away and change it. Some students not to care, seem to care. If the students thought it was helpful, more of them would ask for feedback. Um, in fact, tutors often delegated feedback to teaching assistants, so um, biology, uh, they have access to the postgraduate demonstrators. I think it's the students' initiative whether they use them, and it's obvious they're the ones who do much better. They had some input, um, and in uh, chemistry, they go to the postgraduates first, and then to me if necessary. If the students send them their drafts, then the demonstrator will give them feedback, but it's uh, up to them. In fact, several. Uh, teachers in the, in the, social, in the sciences um, didn't see improving students' uh, literacy as, as their job. Um, an engineer said, how helpful is the written feedback for improving students were? I've no idea. I don't teach them how to write. They go to academic writing classes, I think. I don't think my feedback would help them to write. So, so very different views about writing from, um, from faculties. The final um, uh, argument for specificity I, won't, I want to make is, is perhaps the most obvious one, um, and that's the kinds of writing that students are asked to, uh, to do. So different fields value different uh, kinds of argument and set different writing tasks, for example. So in the humanities and social sciences, analyzing and synthesizing from different sources is important, whereas in science and technology, more activity-based skills uh, are needed. Um, we also know um, that uh, different fields make use of different genres. So in their large-scale corp corpus study of, uh, of 30 disciplines in UK universities, for example, um, Nessie and Gardner's class now classic study uh, found um, how many? 13 different genre families ranging from uh, narratives, um, methodology recounts through critiques to proposals. Um, very different genres differing, differing considerably, not only in their generic structure, but also in their social purpose and the links that they formed uh, with other genres. 
that even in fairly cognate fields, um, uh, students are given very different texts. So in looking at the assignments given to medical students, for example, uh, Jimenez found that nursing and midwifery students were given um, almost totally different assignments. So again, this underlies the, the different ways that students uh, uh, are assessed and the different expectations that are uh, for their writing. Now it's clear that disciplinary specificity is a key factor. Um, the, the, the tomatoes were a metaphor, but I can't remember what for now. Um, uh, they'll come to me. Um, but the, um, we can see disciplines, I mean discipline is a fuzzy term, but we can see it as, uh, as language using communities. And the term helps us to bring writers, texts and readers together. So they provide the context within which we learn to communicate and interpret each other's talk. They're the, the shorthand ways that we um, relate to each other. We gradually acquire the specialized language of our, uh, uh, that we need to participate as group members. This is what Wells said about this um, uh, a long, long time ago. Each subject discipline constitutes a way of making sense of human experience that's evolved over generations. Each is dependent on its own particular practices, its instrumental procedures, its criteria for judging relevance and validity, and its conventions of acceptable forms of argument. So each has developed its own mode of discourse. So to work in a discipline, we need to um, be able to engage in these practices and um, to understand these discourses, understanding the distinctive ways that disciplines have of asking questions, addressing uh, literature, criticizing ideas, and presenting arguments. I just want to spend a few minutes to go back to Hong Kong U and give you uh, a couple of examples of um, English in the discipline courses to show that in reality, specificity is something of a movable feast, and it very much depends, as you probably know, on finding influential uh, collaborators in faculties. Um, people that will, uh, are, are prepared to partner in uh, building uh, courses. Now, um, one of our courses uh, is um, for the business faculty. You know, the eight majors, one course, because we couldn't get them to collaborate in the ways we wanted them to. But because of this, we, we thought, well, what could we do best with this? Um, and we thought the best thing we could do was to help students to analyze and evaluate text to discover the criteria for judging good writing. Um, our courses have two writing assessments on the two genres that are common to all the majors. Um, I think that's cases and reports. And a third assignment, which assesses uh, what students have said about their learning over their course by asking them to compare the two genres. Now these classes are, are flipped. Um, so a lot of the input occurs before each course through a mini lecture um, and it's accessed by students on the, on the course Moodle. Um, it's designed to get them to reflect and provide short and thoughtful responses, which are then taken up by the teacher in class. Um, and then after class, the, the students follow up with work on assignments and uh, other exercises. Now, I want to show you um, a, a very brief two-minute video, um, which is uh, a, a mini lecture from an early part of the course, which tries to help students to see um, uh, to understand that texts have patterns uh, without giving them um, prescriptive models to follow. The, um, what students do, uh, pre-video, they've, they've, they've written an academic genre and which, uh, they're starting to evaluate it for quality. Then they watch the video, take notes, write down questions that can be followed up in class. And after the video, um, they apply this, this learning to text samples, deconstruct a text, and, and write a new text. Um, can I just put this on now?
In the rationale for the course, we talked about developing evaluative capabilities as key to lifelong learning. In this short video, the focus is on one key aspect of language awareness that you need to develop to become a skilled writer. That is genre awareness. Before knowing how to develop your genre awareness, we need to know what a genre is. Most of you will be familiar with film genres such as horror, romantic comedy or thrillers. These are types or classes of film. In most cases, we can work out what genre of film we're watching from the start of the film. Horror films, for example, typically begin at night and or in poor weather, they have very dramatic music and often begin with very little dialogue. In most cases, we can instantly identify the horror genre as we're very aware of what goes into such a film. Now, it is very unlikely that you'll be directing or producing films in your future job, but you will very likely be expected to write in a variety of textual genres. In the workplace, these may include reports, memos, emails, and while at university, essays, reports, and case analyses. So now we know what a genre is, how can we develop genre awareness? Developing genre awareness means becoming aware of how certain texts are similar in their structure and organization, in how content is dealt with, and how vocabulary, sentence structure, and tone are used. Developing this awareness means noting what skilled writers are doing with content and how they're expressing content. By making this noticing explicit, you can discover guidelines for writing similar texts yourself in the future. So genre awareness gives you criteria for success, which can help you evaluate your own developing text. Good writers are always aware of their audience and purpose, and genre awareness helps us meet the expectations of our audience. However, there is a common misconception about genre. The misconception is that people feel there's an exact prescribed way of writing a text. This is not true. No two films are exactly alike, as different actors, directors and scriptwriters make big differences to the overall film. In texts, different forces act on genres. Centripetal forces are the factors which are typical in any text, but there are always centrifugal forces that operate on texts, such as creativity, writer styles and different audience expectations. These forces mean that no two texts are exactly alike. So, a big part in developing your evaluative capabilities is to become more aware of genre and to notice features of language that good writers use. Becoming better at noticing and becoming more genre aware are vital for helping you develop as a skilled writer who can write different texts in different genres that meet the expectations of their various audiences. Now, here are some questions for you. So that's, that's one example where we didn't get a lot of cooperation, but we tried to um, uh, create something which was relevant and specific to the, um, the business students. In contrast, um, English for Clinical Pharmacy is a very highly specific th third year course uh, focusing on common spoken and written genres um, in drug information developed in close cooperation with the medical faculty. Now, early in the course, students learn new terms and strategies for learning new terms, um, stems, prefix, suffixes, and so on, for, for analyzing medical terms. But learning is mainly through a drug information project. Um, here we, uh, this is jointly devised with the pharmacy department where students evaluate and recommend two drugs to treat the same condition. Now, to make it authentic, the uh, pharmacy department um, told us which drugs to use and also suggested the genre that students should write, which is a, a hospital medical bulletin, um, which many pharmacists will be asked to write um, if they work in hospitals. Um, and again, very close collaboration with the pharmacy department who also co uh, um, assess the, the final product. So um, these are examples of um, pharmacy, uh, uh, hospital pharmacy bulletins, drug evaluation bulletins, um, on the Moodle near the end of the course. And they're marked up and students analyze them, think about them, work, them in, work in pairs to compare them and look at their structure and the kinds of evaluative and comparative language. 
So the project provides an opportunity for learners to develop and practice very highly specific, very highly relevant uh, disciplinary research and academic writing skills. Um, the involvement of the pharmacy tutors is, is crucial, um, both in, in, in providing uh, information for the course and in assessing the student's performance. Um, okay, very briefly, um, I, I guess I want to underline that saying, I think I'm, I'm less dogmatic about specificity than I used to be, but I still think we need to get as close to students' needs as we possibly can. Um, this is because the ways we use language and the ways that we um, are, are, are situated in, in domains of knowledge and ways of talking about knowledge which are highly specific, which vary across the disciplines. I've been talking about specificity for, I don't know, 20 years, but Ballard and Clenchy's point from the mid-80s, I think, is as relevant now as it, as it was then. They said, just as modes of analysis vary with disciplines and with the groups that practice them, physicists, psychologists, literary critics, so too does language. For the student new to a discipline, the task of learning the distinctive mode of analysis is indivisible from the task of learning the language of the discipline. So one area of development cannot proceed without the other. So I think that's a very uh, um, succinct way of, of putting what I've been trying to say. Um, and I think the bottom line is that EAP is not about topping up um, deficiencies in language skills that, that students haven't acquired at school. It's about equipping students with a new kind of literacy that they need to participate in their learning when they're at university. Um, that's all I've got to say. Thanks for your attention. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much, Professor Harland. Um, I wanted to ask you something that I have been um, talking about at my university, which is Queen Mary University of London, about introducing something similar to what you have introduced in Hong Kong. Because uh, we work with the departments and we, are, we offer a series of uh, discipline-specific in-sessional writing and uh, you know, academic skills modules for different departments. And time and again, we are told that home students need, um, need this as well. It's not just the international, but home students. And we have heard papers here where people have talked about the needs of home students. So I wanted uh, your view on whether you think this could be introduced at U UK universities. Yeah, I mean, we did something very similar when I was working in London at Institute of Education. Um, about a third of the students going through our uh, specific writing uh, courses were native English-speaking UK students. Um, I don't... I mean, we, we have native speaker students in our courses in Hong Kong, and they very often ask for exemptions, and we refuse. Um, you know, you must take this course because it's good for you. We know best, don't we? <laughs> I mean, no, I think, I think it's uh, um, because somebody speaks English doesn't mean to say they can speak academic English. Yeah, thank you. Thanks very much. I just have a question. Um, to what extent did you find the e-learning provision effective? And Sorry, to what extent did you find the e-learning provision effective? And how did the students take to it? Right, e-learning. Um, I mean, every, every one of our courses has a Moodle element. Um, uh, the, the university mandates that every course should have, um, I think it's a, a, something like 150 hours of learning. And we only have them for 33 hours. So we have to provide instruction out of class for the remainder. So we're, we're very dependent on on various aspects of e-learning. So every course has a Moodle um, and uh, with, um, with, with activities which um, you, they have to complete uh, a set of activities which unlock the next set of activities. So it doesn't involve a lot of teacher monitoring, um, but the, the students have to demonstrate that they've done it. 
Um, I, I don't see how you can teach a language in the um, uh, limited um, time that we have over a semester. We, they, have to, they have to be given work out of class um, and often they, they don't always prioritize English and so it needs to be uh, compulsory out of class English. Yeah, thanks for your question. Um, I have a question about uh, um, the discipline and identity bit that you... Oh, sorry. <laughs> That's all right, we've got time for one more. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm sort of interested in um, our identity as EAP practitioners. You mentioned you, you looked at different disciplines, and um, I wonder whether you had the chance to look at the, the sort of BIOS, the mini uh, biographies of presenters, for example, at this conference, or whether uh, you... Um, Perhaps are looking to look at you know to look at this and um, Interesting. how yeah, we that, represent ourselves as you know EAP practitioners. Yeah, um, I think that's a really fascinating question. Um, uh, it, it, I, I haven't. I mean, I think it would be worth doing, um, and I think it would be worth looking at. Do those representations look more like? these kinds of things from academic articles, or do they look like the sort of representations we've been hearing um, Alex and other people talking about? You know, do we, uh, do we see ourselves um, in this um, professional academic way, or do we see ourselves as, as kind of um, uh, you know, slaves to um, other disciplines in the university machine? Um, I think that would be a very interesting. Yeah, that's right. I can compare perhaps with yeah. applied linguistics. So yeah. yeah, thanks <laughs> for the question. Thank you. It. Thank you. I'm sorry we haven't got time for more questions. Um, thank you, Ken, so much for your talk and for giving us food for thought. Um, what you say is so relevant to what we do and I think will we'll help make all of our teaching more research informed um, than it currently is. Thank you also for your contributions at the pre-conference event and throughout the conference, um, all your questions and comments after talks and things like that and for taking the time to talk to other people. So thank you once again for, for coming. <laughs> <laughs>